Yeah, everyone. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Today I'm really happy to have uh, Hoon Cho from MIT uh, to give us uh, a little bit of um, a, a nice talk about his work on biomedical data sharing and analysis with privacy. Thank you, Hoon. All right, well, thank you for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in uh, for my talk. Um, so let me just start up my slide here. Just give me one second. Let's see. Right, so my talk will be about how do we enable sharing and analysis of sensitive biomedical information while preserving privacy. So as some of you may know, we're currently in the era of big biomedical data, and this is mostly driven by high throughput experimental technologies in various domains. And as a result, we now have these large data sets that are scattered around the world in um, different labs, institutes, and companies. So these include um, genetic sequences, which are held by large biobanks, and also by private individuals more recently, thanks to um, direct-to-consumer um, sequencing companies. There are also pharmacological data sets that are generated by academic and industry labs. And of course, there are medical data, which includes electronic health records that are generated and stored by hospitals around the world. So the, the goal of our research that I will tell you about today is uh, to provide a way to pull together these rich troves of biomedical information to empower scientific advances. Unfortunately, we're currently at a stalemate where on the one hand, we have these large amounts of biomedical data that hold great potential for science. And on the other, we have these researchers who want access to these data. However, a lot of this biomedical information is often sensitive, and this presents a key barrier to open data sharing. So this could be uh, genetic or medical information of private individuals, which could be misused if it lands in the wrong hands, or financially valuable information that commercial companies may wish to keep private. So we're currently in a situation where a lot of, a lot of this data is not shared at all due to privacy concerns or shared in an insecure manner with high likelihood of leakage or misuse. So what we need are new computational frameworks that allow data sharing and biomedicine while protecting privacy. So this is what we do in our research. Uh, in particular, we develop pipelines and algorithms based on modern cryptography techniques um, to overcome this privacy barrier to enable wider data sharing in the field. And the hope is that going through these techniques, uh, we can make new discoveries together with access to data whose scale far exceeds what individual entities can achieve. So in this talk, I will tell you about two of my recent publications in enhancing privacy in biomedicine, and it will cover two different domains. So one in population genetics and the other in drug discovery. And as I will describe to you, each of these domains present unique computational challenges that we overcome with novel techniques. So let me first start with the genetics example. So I'm sure many of you have seen a plot that looks like this before. So this is about the exponential increase in the number of human genomes that are sequenced. So back in 2002, when Human Genome Project was completed, we started out with just two human genomes. But uh, thanks to next generation sequencing technologies, this number increased very rapidly. And now we're at about half a million genomes. And it's projected to reach more than 10 millions, and quite possibly a lot more, by 2025. So what this means for us is that now we have large amounts of genetic sequences out there that we could leverage to gain better understanding into the genetic basis of important human conditions like cancer and diabetes. But the bad news is that a lot of this data lies outside the reach of biomedical researchers. So first of all, as I alluded to earlier, a lot of this data is scattered in isolated silos in different institutes and labs and companies. And furthermore, due to the sensitive nature of genetic information, these existing repositories impose strict and time-consuming access review process that slows down the rate of, uh, rate of research. 
So what we wanted to do was to increase researchers access to these genetic data through what we call secure genome crowdsourcing. And the idea here is to enable private entities and individuals to securely donate their data to science without worrying about their privacy. So if we had a framework like this, what could we achieve? So one thing you can do with a large amount of genetic data is to look at variation across different individuals. So this includes things like single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, which describe single letter differences between uh, the genomes of two different individuals. So there are a lot of databases out there already that try to collect these genetic differences among individuals um, from a large population and to try to understand how these differences affect various human traits. And this is most commonly done through what's known as genome-wide association studies or GWAS. So here, the goal is to look for locations within the genome that are statistically correlated with phenotypes of interest, like diseases. So here I'm showing you an example catalog of, of these GWAS findings that's taken from the NHGRI EBI database. You can see the 24 different chromosomes and locations within them that uh, are linked with particular diseases or uh, other phenotypes uh, that are marked by different colors. So back in 2008, when GWAS first came about, we only had less than 100 of these GWAS associations that are known for a single disease, Crohn's disease. But as we gained access to more and more genomes, this number increased by a lot. And I think now the current number is actually over 60,000 unique associations throughout the genome. And this covers a wide range of human traits, including psychiatric disorders like Alzheimer's disease or uh, complex human traits like height. So although this is great, we still believe that we're still yet to reach the full potential of GWAS due to the following two reasons. So the first challenge is that there is a limited statistical power with existing databases. So even though we now have access to these data banks with large amount of data, uh, including UK Biobank, which is projected to reach um, half a million genomes fairly soon, some genetic signals are either too rare or weak to be identified. And to be able to detect these signals, we need larger sample sizes. And this is especially a problem if you're working with diseases where patient recruitment is difficult, maybe because the disease itself is very rare. So another challenge is that there is a lack of diversity in study populations. So existing data repositories like UK Biobank, China Kadri Biobank, or Million Veterans Program in the United States, these tend to stay within a national boundary due to the oversight that's needed to ensure that these data are being handled properly. And this naturally leads to study populations that are not fully representative of the global human population, which limits our understanding of human genetics. So just to give you some examples, we um, weren't able to find this key gene uh, that's associated with diabetes until we looked at the Mexican population because the genetic variant that was tagging for it was not found in the European population. And you can also think about training predictive models for disease risks based on uh, one's genetic pattern. And if you were to train that model on a particular subpopulation, then it doesn't make sense to take that and then apply to a, an entirely different population. So really the only way to overcome both of these challenges, limited statistical power and also lack of diversity, is to share genomes across nations and institutions so that we can gain access to larger and more diverse genetic databases. However, this leads to important privacy concerns. So not, not only do we not fully understand the full extent of information that's contained in one's genome, because one's genetic material is mostly fixed throughout one's lifespan, if it's leaked, it's leaked for good. And in recent years, there's been an increasing number of studies that show different ways of uh, breaching genomic privacy, and perhaps the most notable ones, the, the paper that I'm showing at the bottom of the slide, uh, which was published in Science last fall, 
where the authors were able to show that given the DNA sample of a particular individual, they can pinpoint the identity of that individual by querying the sample against public genealogy databases like gedmatch.com. And somewhat surprisingly, they were able to show that the majority of white population in the United States are susceptible to such an attack. And even though this is great for criminal justice, because we can catch criminals better through their DNA samples, this, all, this capability also makes a lot of us uh, concerned due to the potential for misuse. So our solution to this was to leverage secure computation to allow researchers to analyze these sensitive genetic data sets without actually giving them direct access to the raw genetic data. So here the main, uh, main idea is to divide computation across multiple computing entities so that each individual entity does not gain information about the input. So in the next few slides, I will give you a brief overview of how this system works. Uh, just to make sure everyone's familiar with this. So many of you are probably familiar with secret sharing. So this is at the core of this multi-party computation framework. So let's say we have a study participant who wants to share their genome with researchers. So this, um, this is represented by this private number X that's shown on the slide. And in secret sharing, we will be dividing this number into multiple shares and distribute them to multiple computing parties. So here I'm showing you an example where there's only two computing parties, but you can think about adding more parties to this system. So the key property we want here is that each of these individual shares look random to these computing parties, so they don't reveal any information about the private number X. But together, these shares will encode information about X. And in particular, in our system, we use an efficient version of these, uh, this secret sharing framework, which is called additive secret sharing where you have the property that if you add up all these shares, you get the original number back. Another way of thinking about this from the perspective of the study participant is to sample a uniform random number R, give it to one of the computing parties, and then compute X minus R and give that to the other computing party. So this is one way of generating these shares. So the reason why secret sharing is so useful in this context is not, not only it allows multiple entities to collectively re represent a private information, it also allows them to perform computation over these private data sets while keeping, keeping everything in the form of secret shares. So this is what's known as multi-party computation. And you can think of this framework as a collection of uh, pipelines, uh, protocols, building block protocols that define simple operations, say like addition, multiplication, division, and all these protocols will look something like this. So each of these protocol take their input numbers as secret shares, it will do some computation over it and output the desired computation result over the private input also as secret shares. So this is done in a way that the actual values of the raw input is not revealed during the process. And the idea is now that we have the secret shares of this output, these shares can be combined to reveal the result of the computation, or these can be plugged into other protocols that look like this, so you get composability. You can uh, put together these simple protocols to get more complex functionality. And in general, a lot of these protocols will be interactive in the sense that they um, they require these computing parties to talk to each other, send messages, so we ensure that these messages are randomized and they look random so that they don't reveal anything about the input. So let me give you a, a couple of very simple examples just to give you some intuition about how this works. So let's say we had two private numbers, X and Y, and we wanted to compute their sum. So we're going to start by secret sharing these two numbers with two competing parties. So they have x1, x2, y1, y2. Uh, recall that we're using additive secret sharing. So these shares add up to these numbers. So in this case, addition is very simple. So we can just have each of these competing parties add up their respective shares. And you can see that these two resulting numbers represent the secret sharing of the desired output x plus y, because if you add them up, you get x plus y. And this generalizes to affine functions over, uh, over private input. 
Now, doing multiplication in this context is more complicated. So we're going to ne need a additional ingredient, which is known as Beaver multiplication triple. So it's, it's a set of three numbers, two uniform random numbers, A and B, and their product, A times B. And these will, in turn, be secret shared with the computing parties so that they, they start out with these five numbers. So now what the computing parties will do is they will exchange these two messages so that they reveal the values of x minus a and y minus b. And this is OK to do because these parties don't know the values of a and b. And since these are uniform random numbers, they hide information about x and y. And now given these two extra numbers, the parties can compute individually compute these expressions. And if you add these two up, you, you can see that things cancel out and you get x times y back. So the, this is also, um, this can be viewed as secret shares of the desired output, x times y. So there are different ways of generating these Beaver uh, triples. And the one that we use in our framework is the, the simplest and most efficient approach, which is to introduce a third party, uh, here shown as computing party zero. We sample all these random numbers, uh, performs multiplications over them, and distributes them to the other computing parties. And note that CP0 does not see anything about the private input. It's only working with random numbers. So I showed you how to do addition and multiplication. And you can define similar protocols for other operations, like division and comparison and things like that. And the idea is to put these protocols together and compose them so that we can do a more useful computation. And in our case, what we're interested in is taking a large amount of genetic data as secret shares and computing the GWAS results based on that. So the idea of multiple, uh, applying multi-party computation to the GWAS problem has been around for a while. But the main reason why this hasn't been adopted in the community was that this didn't scale to real world data sets. And the main step in GWAS that poses a challenge is what's called population stratification correction. So here's the basic idea of this problem. So in, in GWAS, we're looking for correlations between genotypes and disease status. And hopefully, the genotype um, hits that we find tell us something about the true risk factor that underlies these diseases, that, that tell us something biologically meaningful about the disease. But there are other sources of information that influence one's genetic uh, patterns, such as ancestry. So if you just analyze the correlation between genotype and disease, some of them might be due to ancestry rather than interesting biological patterns. This is, so this is a potential confounding factor in the analysis. So the common way to tackle this problem is to use principal component analysis. Uh, there are other techniques too, but this is one of the most popular ones. So PCA is performed over the large uh, input genotype matrix, so individuals on, on, on the rows and uh, different positions within the genome on the, on the columns. So we do PCA on that matrix, and that gives us global patterns in the genotype data that tell us something about the ancestry of the, the study participants. And once we have that information, we can uh, correct for these patterns in the subsequent analysis in GWAS. So unfortunately, doing PCA under secure computation is not going to scale because PCA is a very complex calculation that requires repeated multiplications over a large genotype matrix. So really, the, the main contribution of this work uh, is that we figured out how to restructure this computation so that we can achieve full-scale secure GWAS with practical performance. So how do we do this? So here's one key idea. So here, I'm showing you the most uh, general setup of multi-party computation. You have a set of inputs that are given as sacred shares. You feed it through some composition of protocols, and you get a set of outputs out. So if you use the framework that I described to you in this, in this setting, then for each of the pairwise multiplications you have in the computation, you would need to generate three random numbers. So if you have a lot of these pairwise multiplications in the computation, which is the case if you're trying to do PCA, 
then this computation blows up very quickly and becomes infeasible. So we were actually able to figure out a way to uh, reduce the redundancy in this process and actually push the randomness to the input and the output so that now, instead of generating random numbers per multiplication, uh, pairwise multiplication, we generate one random number per input number and one and possibly a few more for each output numbers. So now the amount of random data that we need to generate depends on the input and output sizes rather than the, the number of pairwise multiplications in the computation. And this leads to significant improvements in scalability. So we use this technique to build more efficient, secure computation building blocks, including matrix multiplication, exponentiation, and power iteration, among others. And we introduced a couple other techniques to achieve further scalability. So one of them was to use randomized linear algebra for population stratification, where the idea is that instead of performing PCA on the full genotype matrix, we can reduce it down to a small random subspace and use um, the solution of that subproblem as an approximation to the full problem. So this is a way of reducing the scalability of the problem while uh, obtaining high accuracy. And the other technique that we introduced was to use shared pseudorandom number generators. Um, so the main idea here is there are a lot of places in our pipeline where one party samples a bunch of random numbers and sends that to the other computing party over the network. Now, because these are just random numbers, we can actually um, turn this around and have these two parties share the same seed for these random number generators so they can independently sample uh, these numbers. So this reduces the communication complexity of the protocol by a lot. So here's an overview of our secure GWASP protocol. So at the top, you have these study participants who have private genotype and phenotype data. And they will secret share these data with a set of computing parties. So each computing party now has a copy of the input data without actually being able to see the underlying raw input. And these computing parties will now carry out an interactive protocol that does the GWAS computation. And the key thing to note here is that this pipeline includes all the standard components of GWAS, including quality control, population stratification analysis, which is the PCA step that I mentioned, and also the final association tests. And at the end, once they have the GWAS results, they can combine their shares to reveal and publish the, the outcome. And there's this third party that generates all these random numbers, the beaver triples that I mentioned, and shares these with the other computing parties. And again, note that CP0 doesn't receive anything from the study participants. So what kind of privacy guarantees do we get with this system? Well, you, based on the properties of the secret sharing, we can say that what each computing party sees is statistically indistinguishable distinguishable from random. So this is an information theoretic privacy guarantee. And this holds as long as CP0, the, the third party, and at least one other computing party uh, do not collude with others. And you can imagine uh, relaxing this assumption by introducing additional computing parties, because as long as two of them do not collude, we have privacy. And in addition, we can also handle malicious parties who or allow to deviate from the protocol to gain some information about the private input. And we can do this by using message authentication codes. So you can think of this as introducing various checkpoints in the pipeline so that you can, we can check whether the, all the parties are following the protocol as prescribed. To benchmark our system, we used three published GWAS studies covering lung cancer, bladder cancer, and age-related macular degeneration. And you can see that these cover uh, different data set sizes, uh, ranging from 9,000 individuals to 23,000. And as you can see, across the board, the GWAS statistics that we get from our secure pipeline accurately matches the ground truth, which is computed based on the raw data. And if you actually look at the top hits of each of these data sets, it also accurately matches with the ground truth. 
And in particular, the top two hits that we were able to find on the lung cancer data set, uh, which include TERT, which is a polymerase elongation protein, and VTI1A, which is a vesicle transport protein. So these are well-known lung cancer genes that were actually also the same top two hits in the original publication. So what this is telling us is that now we have these tools that we can use to find these biologically meaningful um, associations without actually letting anyone see the raw data. And we can do, do so within a reasonable uh, runtime. So here I'm showing you runtime and communication bandwidth uh, as a function of number of individuals in the data. We simulated up to 100,000 individuals. And in, in the plots, the different line colors are showing different steps within the pipeline, and the black ones showing the total number. So you can see both of these metrics depend linearly on the data set size. And if you were to extrapolate this to a, um, a large number, say a million individual GWAS, then the runtime you get is, based on this figure, it's, it's around two months. So that's still very high, but we were recently able to get this down to a couple of weeks through better parallelization. So uh, unless there are burning questions that people want to ask me right now, I, I would like to uh, move on to describing how to apply these efficient multi-party computation to a different problem where we want to allow multiple entities to jointly train machine learning models on pharmacological data sets. Uh, I have a quick question. So uh, sure. like, can you remind us in the model before, who's, who's sharing the data and who's protect? Like, are these like data sets that are privately owned or? Yeah, let me go back to that overview figure one second. So the idea is that this, I mean, so this could be instantiated in many different ways, but so one way you can think about this is the study participants could be private individuals. So uh, people like us holding our, uh, you know, our own genetic sequences and we can give it to particular groups of researchers to, to use for GeoS. Or this, this could also be done um, at the level of institutes where uh, each of the study participant is actually a, a large lab containing a whole collection of these genotype and phenotype data, and they share these data with each other to get a larger data to work with. Oh, okay. so, okay, so they want to combine their data sets. That's exactly, yeah. Really, okay, but then how do you, how do you, if they're trying to, I mean, how do you prevent collusion? Because everything depends, I mean, security here depends on these two guys don't collude together, right? Otherwise, the whole secret sharing scheme will, will not yeah. work. Yeah, so that's that's a key assumption of this this model, and um, at least for CP zero, we think that government entities like NIH or FDA might be interested in taking these roles. And in fact, we have talked to NIH, and they are uh, willing to play this role for pilot studies. So we know that 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 is possible already. And these computing parties are um, ac academic labs, so um, so a lot of them might have the, the desirable credential, credentials to be trustworthy. So it might be a reasonable setup in, in, in practice. You know, but they might not be secure, right? I mean, suppose one hacker hacks both of them. That's what I'm worried about. Right, right. So I, I can see this is a, this could be a <laughs> big concern if you had only two parties. But as I mentioned, you can introduce additional parties into the system. And as long as one of them is not compromise, we have privacy. OK, and uh, another thing that I was interested in, but I don't know if uh, maybe I'll ask in the end. OK. I'll ask in the end, so I want to hear the, the rest of this. Sure. All right. All right. So as many of you know, drug discovery is a very expensive process. It requires years of research and large amount of resources. And uh, faced with declining productivity in recent years, big pharma companies are now exploring a collaborative approach to drug discovery where they try to pull together their data, knowledge, and resources to find new drug candidates together. However, existing partnerships for collaboration are largely limited in scope due to conflicting financial interests. And this includes 
things that are related to intellectual property claims. And this is a key barrier to collaboration in, the, in, in this field. So a key step in the drug discovery pipeline is to predict novel drug target interactions, or DTI. So given a set of known interactions between drug compounds and protein targets, we may want to predict whether a given compound could be repurposed to target a different protein, or given an entirely new compound, whether it shows any bioactivity for protein targets of interest. And because of the overwhelming size of the space of interactions between millions of chemical compounds and tens of thousands of these proteins, experimentally characterizing all of these interactions in a lab setting is not feasible, even with the help of high throughput screening technologies that were developed recently. So a common way to tackle this challenge is to leverage computational models that train on the observed set of interactions and these models are then used to prioritize the unknown set of interactions and follow up uh, so that researchers can follow up the top predictions uh, in, in, in a lab experiment. So now if we had a system that, were able, that was able to pull together data from multiple entities, then we can put together a larger training data for these computational models so we can hope to achieve higher prediction accuracy. But there, there are privacy data privacy concerns related to this. So there could be interactions that have commercial value that these companies may not be willing to share with others, or these companies may be working with novel drug compounds that they cannot reveal without any legal protection. So simply asking everyone to share their data with others is not going to be a viable approach to collaboration. So our idea was to leverage multi-party computation um, to tackle this challenge. So just to give you a brief overview of this pipeline. Um, so in the beginning, the collaborating entities, so this could be different uh, pharma companies or academic labs. So each of these entities have their own list of privately observed drug target interactions. And they will secret share this. So much like the GWAS example, they will secret share all of these private data sets uh, among themselves to construct this pool data set. So this represents the collective knowledge of the field about drug target interaction. And the idea is to feed this through a similar secure multi-party computation protocol, um, where now the goal is, uh, instead of computing the, the statistics, like in the GWAS example, now we're going to train a machine learning model on this input data and use these models to obtain double predictions. And at the end, I have a quick question. So, uh, what is a DTI? Can you can you remind us what is it? Drug target interaction. What does it mean? It's an interaction between a pair, so uh, between a drug compound and a protein target. And what what is it? A number or it measures the interaction or it's a so zero? It could be a yes or no, or it could also be a continuous value uh, okay. representing the confidence. And and how many of these do we have? How many drugs and how many? So it's usually in the order of millions of drug compounds, and the proteins, uh, that's on the order of tens of thousands. OK. And you, you were saying that each company have this data, these separate data on these DTIs, and they don't want to share it? Right, because a lot of them are commercially valuable. OK. Thank you. Right, so the idea is to pull together these private data, train machine learning models, generate predictions, and then we can, at the end, distribute these results back to the collaborating entities as a reward for collaboration. And the key thing to note here is that we're not just hiding information about the interaction itself, but also about the identity of these stroke compounds and protein targets um, that, that these entities are looking at. So what, what, do, what do we normally do for DTI prediction? So there are two main branches of methods. So the first one is based on matrix factorization. Here, we're going to represent the known set of interactions between drugs and targets as a matrix. So we have drugs on one side, targets on the other, and entries represent interaction between a pair of drug and target. So here, we're going to use some form of low rank matrix factorization to model the, the latent structure of this matrix so that we can try to fill in the missing entries of this matrix. 
The other branch of methods is based on a network representation of the data. And here, we're going to use random walk or uh, some form of network diffusion process to propagate information over these graph structures uh, so that we can try to fill in missing edges of this graph. So the nodes here are drugs or targets, and edges represent an interaction between two molecules. So unfortunately, if we were to develop, uh, implement these state-of-the-art techniques under secure computation, they do not scale. And this is mainly due to the fact that working with these uh, matrix and graph type of representations of the data um, often requires uh, computational resource that depends quadratically on the number of drugs or targets. And given millions of compounds, that usually uh, is too much to handle. Hold, I have a question. So here, uh, can you uh, elaborate more on uh, the matrix factorization and the network diffusion method? So uh, what are we trying to do? So in, for example, in the network diffusion based method, so it's a graph and some edges are there. And so what, what are you trying to learn? So the idea is this graph has a lot of missing edges. Yeah. So um, by using random walk or network diffusion, you can try to model, you can try to analyze the, the local structure of this graph. So basically, um, for this I, a node i here that I'm showing you if, you, if you run random walk with restart, starting at node i, yeah. it will give you a vector at the end that summarizes the local structure of this uh, of this molecule in the, within this graph. And then you can use that to try to predict other uh, missing edges. So, so if the graph is, is, is not, con, um, is not uh, directed, this is going to be related to the degree of the node. Right, but it goes, if you, want, uh, if you use random walk or network diffusion, it will go beyond that. It, it will go beyond just the local neighborhood. Oh, OK. And you want to, so you, you uh, so you, you to build that graph, you need the data from all these participants. Right, and piece them together into a graph. And then you piece them together, and then you want to run that diffusion model and on this diffused on uh, this piece together graph and then return these values back to the to all the participants. That's that's the that's the goal. Right, right. Or rather the, the final predictions of the the predicted edges. And then in, in, in the first uh, part of uh, in the upper part, the matrix factorization. So, mm -hmm. so this is a very sparse matrix because right because we have millions of drugs and tens of thousands of targets, and we only observe a small fraction of this matrix. And you and you want to do a low rank factorization of it. Right, right. So that and will give us. I'm assuming so. I got to put it back into the bigger problem. So this matrix is not owned by one participant. So it's just exactly. So oh. each, each participant has a small subset of this matrix. And the idea is to put that together. OK. So, all right. Yeah. All right. Great. Right. So because these existing methods do not scale under secure computation, we have to turn to a different approach to DTI prediction, and is in particular one that's based on a neural network. Yes. Can you? You like can't that? see my slide? No. Oh. Yeah, we lost your slides. Oh. One second. Do you see my monitor? No, we don't. Uh, maybe maybe you can rejoin. Oh yeah. I think that would solve it. Leave and rejoin. Leave and rejoin. Yeah. Okay. One second. I'll I'll do that. Give me one. Are we being recorded? Yes. Hi. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Right. Right. So as I was saying, 
we are going to summarize the chemical and structural properties of these molecules as a feature vector. And um, for the drug compounds, we use what's known as structural fingerprint or ECFP. Uh, so this is a widely used representation of these drug molecules. And for the protein, we use a functional domain profile that's downloaded from the PFAM database. So these are known segments within these proteins with, with a known function. Um, so it tells us something about the functional properties of these proteins. And, and note that this is a fairly simple approach to featureizing these molecules. Uh, and um, it's straightforward to substitute in more complex featureization techniques. So now given this feature vector for a um, pair of drug compound and protein target, we can feed this through a standard neural network to try to predict whether these two uh, molecules interact or not. And the idea is to train this model um, through secure multi-party computation framework. And this is more scalable than the previous matrix uh, matrix-based or graph-based approaches, because here now we're taking linear scans uh, through um, the observed list of interactions um, if you're using a standard gradient descent approach. So that doesn't depend quadratically on the number of molecules, given the sparsity of these uh, data sets. And we actually had to make a couple architectural choices that uh, help us achieve more um, efficient MPC. So in particular, for the, these hidden units in these neural networks, we use rectified linear unit activation, which looks something like that. Uh, so it actually requires only a single secure comparison to compute. And there's a similar remark on the objective function. So we use the hinge loss, which looks much like the ReLU function. So that also requires a single secure comparison. So if you think about other popular components, say uh, sigmoid activation, TANH, or for the objective function, the log likelihood function. So these are more nonlinear functions that incur a higher computational overhead under MPC. So as I said, the idea is to build an MPC pipeline that trains this network securely. And we're hiding information about um, the, the training data and also the model parameters throughout the process. And to our knowledge, this is the first demonstration of training these neural networks securely on a large scale real world data. So we tested this pipeline on two benchmark data sets that contain known uh, drug target interactions. So the first one's called drug bank. It contains around 2000 interactions. It's a very small scale data but also very high quality because it's highly curated. And um, the, the second data we use is called Stitch Database. It contains 1.5 million interactions, so it's much larger, but it also includes functional uh, indirect interactions, um, so it's more noisy. But the sheer size of it allowed us to test the scalability of our approach. So how do we do on these data sets? So on the drug bank data, here I'm showing you the prediction accuracy of our pipeline shown in red compared to other baseline techniques. So we actually achieve competitive and even slightly better accuracy than the, the previous state of the art, DTI-Net. And important thing to note here is that all of these baseline methods are being run on the raw, raw data. So there's no privacy there. And on the stitch data set, because this was a much larger data and a lot of these uh, baseline methods uh, depend scales quadratically uh, in the number of drug compounds that are in theta. Some of them we actually could not run on this data, so we could only compare our approach to simple uh, matrix factorization-based techniques uh, that are shown here. So in this case, we were actually able to achieve quite a significant improvement over the existing methods. And again, we're achieving this with the additional guarantee of data privacy. The two different line styles are showing different ways of uh, evaluating the performance. And in particular, it has to do with different ways of sampling negative examples in the data. So how do, how do you explain that you were able to achieve privacy and do better accuracy? Do you have any intuition why this is happening? Or so how? It, right. 
so it's a different model. And also it's using a different uh, feature vector, which is not, so um, let me go back a little bit. So th these data sets only contain information about the interaction between yeah. drug compound and proteins, right? But we're uh, infusing that prediction problem with data that's taken from other data sets, right? So because um, the feature vectors themselves are being taken from other data sets. So we're introducing more information into the system. So maybe that's one reason why this is doing better. And also we're using a more nonlinear approach to prediction based on neural networks. So that could be uh, part of it too. So um, uh, just to make sure I understand correctly. So for example, when you compare the DTI net, was it compare? Uh, was it run on one data set instead of? I'm still thinking that you're combining together securely many data set before you run your learning algorithm. So is data INet just run on a subset of that big set that now you can use? So all of these methods are being trained on the same training data. Okay. But the only difference uh, between our approach and the baseline is that we don't actually look at the raw data. We do it through MPC. Okay. 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 I have a question, quick question. Yes. Uh, are you going to tell us uh, how much time your algorithm would take? Yeah, that's a great uh, segue into my next slide. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, right, so we're able to achieve competitive accuracy within a reasonable training time. So here I'm showing you the runtime per epoch, where epoch is a single training pass through the data in the gradient descent procedure. And this is shown as a function of number of interactions in the data. So even for data sets containing millions of interactions, uh, our running time stays within, within days, <laughs> which is still, uh, we, we think it's feasible at the, at the scale. And I should mention all of our results that, I, that I'm showing you is based on a model that's trained for 1.5 epochs. So it's still within days. So we wanted to go beyond doing a cross-validation experiment and actually show that we can use these pipelines to get novel predictions. So what we did was we took our secure DTI pipeline, trained it on the entire Stitch database, and then prioritized the remaining unknown set of interactions. So here I'm showing you the top predictions from two different versions of our model. Um, and again, this has to do with different uh, approaches to sampling the negative examples uh, during training. And in both cases, a lot, of, a lot of our top predictions were validated through either literature evidence or by our, our own lab experiments. So things that show asterisk next to them are the interactions that we were able to test uh, in a lab setting. Just to point out some examples here, our top prediction in both cases between droloxifene and estrogen receptor alpha and beta, these are actually well-established interactions that reached clinical trial phase three, but later dropped due to uh, the company finding a, an even better drug for this target. And there's a similar story for ceocalcitol and vitamin D receptor. This is, this is also an interaction that led to a clinical trial that reached phase three. And for some reason, both of these interactions were not included in the Stitch database. And perhaps more surprisingly, we were even able to find a completely novel interaction between imatinib and ERBB4, which is a protein kinase. And this we were able to validate in our lab experiment. So similar to uh, what I told you about in the GWAS setting here, we are also able to obtain these novel predictions that are meaningful for us uh, without actually looking at any of the, the private data. And in particular, what this is suggesting is that this Stitch database could have come from multiple entities while preserving privacy. So I wanted to end the talk by pointing out a few future directions that I'm excited about. So I showed you how to leverage multi-party computation to build efficient and secure protocols for uh, the GWAS problem and the DTI prediction problem, but there's still many more applications out there that, that could use an enhancement in data privacy. And in particular, there are a lot of problems at the interface between genomics and other sensitive medical data, including medical images or electronic health records. And we're interested in looking into these problems as well. And 
uh, as was the case in, in the, uh, the pre previous two uh, problems that I told you about today, the main challenge here will be about achieving scalable performance. And I think that's where, that's an area where like a lot of the audience members uh, on this channel may be able to uh, make an impact because I really think that there is a need for more advanced techniques to privatizing uh, data while having the, the ability to do computation with them, including alternative approaches to doing secret sharing. And another direction that I'm interested in looking at is to develop general purpose development tools that uh, researchers can use to implement their own analysis pipelines uh, while preserving data privacy without having to worry too much about the underlying cryptography. And of course, the, the ultimate goal of all of these developments is to actually use them in practice. So we're currently working on deploying our secure GWAS pipeline uh, out in the real world uh, to allow genetic studies that pull data from multiple institutes. So stay tuned for more research updates on these directions. So with that, I wanted to um, let you know that all of the software that I described today are publicly available so you can download and play around with these techniques yourself. I thank my co-authors, David and Brian, for their amazing work. I thank Sean and Jan for providing guidance on these projects and also my PhD advisor, Bonnie Berger. And these are my funding agency and I would be happy to take any questions now. Thanks a lot, Herman. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question about uh, the first part. So you talked uh, about the um, that you uh, you were able to figure out a different way uh, or a different approach to make PCA secure and scalable. Can can you elaborate more on this? Right. So this is the key idea. There was to remove redundancy in the random numbers that we're generating, the beaver multiplication triples. And this that mattered a lot for the PCA problem because in PCA, you have to do, uh, um, so those of you who are familiar with uh, the PCA computation, it, you have to multiply a vector with the same matrix over and over again. This is the power iteration step of PCA. So if you do that in the, in the conventional approach, um, then you would have to generate random numbers for that entire matrix multiple times. But in our case, we uh, reduce that so that we can only generate it. We can regenerate it once and reuse it multiple times. So that actually reduced the complexity by a lot. OK. So I don't know if there is any more questions. Yeah, there are no more questions. So I would like to thank you a lot, uh, Hoon, for this talk. And it'll be available on YouTube. And people can watch it again. And if they have questions, they can comment. So. I'm sure lots of people are going to be interested. Thanks. Thanks Great. a lot. Thank you for having me. Thanks.